it is good to see you today. If we've not met, my name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here. And welcome to everyone watching online, all of our mods that are part of us at the Correction Center campus, and then to everyone gathered at our, at our campuses in Elkhorn and Millard. Uh, so we're in this series that we're calling Stories of Change, where each week we are looking closely at Jesus' personal interactions with, with just one or two other people in the Gospels. And, and we are seeing such important truths about, about who Jesus is, about his power and his character, but also about the way he changes people because Jesus is still changing people. We, we need to see this. And so what I want to do today is I want to jump right in with a question that, that feels kind of big, but we can do this. We can start this way. Here, here's the question I want, us to, I want us to think about today. Here's the question. Are, are people ever beyond the hope of change? We've all heard the cliche, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, which is kind of getting at this, this truth that we get that, that the change a lot of times can feel hard or it even seems impossible. And I know from experience that this cliche has a ring of truth to it. Brookside, uh, meet the Weeby family dog, Applejacks, uh, aka my arch nemesis is uh, what I affectionately call her. But so Applejacks is about seven years old. And way past any ideal time of training, probably two years ago or so, we tried very unsuccessful because, because of some minor effort on our part to train Apple Jacks, to do a couple tricks that we wanted her to do, which she never quite learned, or to not bark at every single person or rabbit or squirrel or leaf that, that, that approached our front yard. But, but Apple didn't do it, right? She's still essentially the same dog today as she was two years ago. Why? Because you can't teach an old dog new tricks is the cliche. Well, once something is baked into someone's habits or their character, we think that they're beyond, be beyond the hope of any, at least substantial change in their lives. I mean, this is why those of us who grew up as Husker fans in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, we're still holding on to hope even after a couple of rough decades. But don't worry, Brookside, next year is going to be different. <laughs> All right, back to our question. Are people ever beyond the hope of change? And I'm not talking about Huskers versus Hawkeyes here. I'm not, I'm not talking about Coke versus Pepsi, Chipotle versus Qdoba. I'm talking about something way more fundamental, something way deeper. Can we see substantial and real change in our character, in our desires, the things that we want, can we, can we see and anticipate changed eternities? Or let me make it personal. What about you? Are you ever beyond the hope of change? Does your past define your future? Is who you have been who you always will be? Or maybe it's not you. Maybe it's somebody close to you. Maybe it's a Maybe it's a close friend. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a teenager or an adult son or daughter. Maybe it's a parent. It's someone you've been praying for for a really long time. And they, they maybe have hurt you tremendously and they are far from God. Is this person, this close to you, are they beyond the hope of change? Today we'll be looking at a conversation between Jesus and one other man in Luke 23. And both of these men, Jesus and this other guy, they're actually dying when we encounter them in this story. They, they are minutes away from death. And so I don't say that to be morbid necessarily, but instead to show that, that we know what they're talking about matters deeply. Because at the end of someone's life, they always talk about the things that matter most. And so we should be leaning in to this. And we will see from Luke 23 that you are never beyond the hope of change. Well, whatever your past, however, however dark it's been, whatever you've done, however hurtful to others, there's always hope. Your past, it doesn't have to define your future or however late in the game you feel like your life is, where you say, I'm not just in the 11th hour or I'm not just past some 11th hour time frame. I'm in the, like the 11th hour and the 59th minute. Some of you very possibly are listening to this and you are months away from passing, you, you receive the diagnosis that nobody ever wants to get. But for a second, let's all of us remind ourselves that none of us 
our ever promised tomorrow. Or some of you, listening to the mods, you're facing sentencing. And you don't know if you'll ever see the outside or, or when you do, it'll be a long time from now. Some of you just feel like you've made so many bad decisions that you're past the hope of change. You, ha- you have such this, this wake of hurt relationships behind you. You have such something like that in your past that you feel like you're past some point of no return. Or maybe you're in your 60s, your 70s, your 80s, and you just feel like so much life has got, gone by that, that any substantial change should have happened decades ago. It is never too late. You are never past the point of no return. There is always hope for change. But how can I say that? How can I make such a bold statement? I don't know all of your situations. But we can read Luke 23 together. Here's why I say that. Here's how I say that, that you're never beyond the hope of change. So here's the setup. Here's what's going on in Luke 23. So Jesus, the perfectly sinless God-man, fully God, fully man, both at the same time, he's being crucified when we enter the scene we're going to read here in a second. And he's, he's experiencing death in one of the most painful, shame-filled ways possible. The, the Roman philosopher and politician Cicero, he, he said crucifixion is the, most crucifi- or is the most cruel and horrifying punishment possible. That's what Jesus was experiencing. He's taking the punishment we deserve for our sins so we could be made right with God. And in this scene, Jesus is being crucified between two criminals. Now we know that crucifixion was reserved for enemies of the state, for violent criminals, and for other dangerous people. So these two men on either side of Jesus, they're not petty thieves. This isn't a misdemeanor that brought them up here. They are, they're enemies of the state. They're most likely armed robbers who committed murder as part of their crime. And one of these criminals, even with what he'd done, with what he knew was in his past, one of these criminals experiences a story of change. His life is changed. It's not the difference that's made through him, but it's the difference that's made in him and for him that I want us to make sure and pause and look long at today. And so as we look at this, at this story of change in Luke 23, verses 32 to 43, we're going to focus on three takeaways. We're going to see the posture of change, we're going to see the response of Jesus, and we will come face to face with the beauty of grace. So let's dig in. Let's look at Luke 23 together. As always, we encourage you to follow along with us as we read. Uh, the Gospel of Luke is the third gospel in your, in your New Testament. So you'll go past Matthew, Mark, and then you'll hit Luke. If you hit John or Acts, you've gone too far. And, and, and as we look at this today, you will leave with fresh hope for change in your own life. And you will see the transforming and powerful nature of grace. Let's check it out. Here's Luke chapter 23, verse 32. It says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they, that is the soldiers that were there, they divided up clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. And so you can just imagine this, this sneering look on their faces as they, as they mock Jesus. He said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. And the soldiers also came up and mocked Jesus. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there's, there's this written notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. And then one of the criminals who was there hanging next to Jesus, hurled insults at him. The, the, the Greek, the, the language that Luke was first written in, the Greek is actually stronger here. It, it says that this criminal was blaspheming Jesus. And so even in his, even in his last minutes, this, this other criminal is, is denigrating the power and the character of God. So he's hurling insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. 
Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him. Real quick, let's stop there. Even that, those three words are big. Because every breath and every word took effort. When you're hanging on a cross, you need to pull yourself up while spikes are driven through your wrists and through your feet to get breath to talk. So even the fact that Jesus answered him shows something about the character of God. Jesus answered him. And he said, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So first takeaway I want to pull out from that passage is the posture of change that we see in one of these criminals. And so what do we learn about change for today that we see in him? Well, to begin with, we need to zoom out from just the gospel of Luke and bring one of the other accounts of Jesus' life, eyewitness account from Matthew to bear on this. In Matthew 27, 44, Matthew says, in the same way the rebels, plural, both of the men who are next to Jesus, the rebels were, uh, who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So when we put Matthew next to Luke there, we see that just minutes before this criminal is defending Jesus, he is hurling insults at him. He's, he's joining with everybody else that's there and making fun of and mocking Jesus. And so, so the question that as we read these, these accounts carefully, we should be asking is, so what changed? What made him go from one minute mocking Jesus, hurling insults at him, to go just a few minutes later to defending Jesus and looking to him? Well, the best clue we have comes in verse 34 of Luke 23, where we hear Jesus pray on the cross in the midst of his suffering where both of these criminals could hear him, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them. Forgive these people that put me up here for they don't know what they're doing. See, Jesus, he wasn't filled with bitterness or resentment at the crowd surrounding them or the rulers sneering at them. Jesus isn't seething with hate at the reality of a tremendously painful, tremendously shameful and unjust death. Jesus isn't doing any of these things. And so it's, instead of bitterness, instead of resentment, instead of hatred, Jesus prays is what he does. And he prays for forgiveness for those who had put him there. And this prayer, it deeply affects one of the two men on the side of Jesus. It did something inside of him. Seeing this act of grace in the midst of suffering, seeing this act of radical just humility and offer of forgiveness, request for forgiveness, it flipped a switch inside of this criminal. Grace is what jumpstarts all of this change that we read about in Luke 23. But before we keep moving and keep going through the passage, don't miss that both criminals heard what Jesus said. Both of them heard him ask for forgiveness, but only one was changed by this. And so as we dissect this posture of change that we see here in this, in this transformed criminal, we need to see that change isn't just a, about being in proximity to Jesus, because both of these men were in proximity to Jesus. Instead, change includes being deeply transformed by Jesus, by by letting his character and his identity and his words sink deeply enough into our heart that we are genuinely transformed by them. They shape us. And so some of you have been keeping Jesus at arm's length for a really long time. You've been in proximity to him, but you've never been deeply and genuinely changed by him. I mean, that would even surprise people that know you well because you're, you're playing a good game. But you know in your heart of hearts that you are still the king of your heart, not Jesus. So which criminal next to Jesus do you resemble? 
as we look at this story in Luke 23. True change starts by letting Jesus in. But now let's ask the question, what does true change look like? Let's look at verses 39 to 42 again. So one of the criminals who hung there, who's unrepentant, who's just determined in his, in his hatred of Jesus, his, his insulting of Jesus, he hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence. We are punished justly for we're getting what our sins deserve, our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And so in this changed criminal, the, the one who is now seeing Jesus through new eyes, we see what this posture of change in, includes. We, we see humility and dependence. He's aware of his sin, that, that he's getting what he deserves. He understands in some way that Jesus is the king. We don't know how full of a knowledge this was, but he says, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. So, so he grasps, grasps something about Jesus' identity here. And then he depends on Jesus. There's no demand. That there's no entitlement. Instead, there's just this simple act of dependence. Jesus, remember me. And so when we put all this together, we see what our own posture of change should include. It includes an awareness of Jesus where we are overcome, overcome and overwhelmed by his grace. It includes an awareness of our sin and this awareness that sin isn't small. God doesn't wink at it. It took his son to die for it. Sin has consequences and sin is weighty. And then this posture of change, it includes dependence. We have no one but Jesus. And so we look to him and what he's done for us, for salvation, for rescue, for him to remember us. This posture of change is for all of us and it's something we never move past. Personally, I've been following Jesus for decades. I, I don't have the same story as either one of these criminals that we read about in Luke 23. Just like your own story is different. Everyone has their own story. I mean, I'm grateful to have grown up in a home where my parents talked about Jesus often. I had, I had so many opportunities to hear and respond to the gospel. But even with my own background, that's so different. I, I, I need to follow the lead of this changed criminal. This is for all of us, where we all look to Jesus. We all cultivate an awareness of sin and our need for a savior. And then we trust in him. This is, this is how we start the Christian life. But then Brookside, this is how we continue the Christian life looking to Jesus, aware of our sin, and depending on him. This is a daily or probably an hourly or minutely posture that we need to cultivate. And so we see this posture of change. There's so much for us here in Luke 23. But now let's go to our second takeaway. How does Jesus respond to this? How, how does Jesus respond to this man who just minutes earlier had been insulting him and blaspheming him. How does Jesus respond to this man who has nothing to offer him? He can't help Jesus get down, right? It's not like he's gonna move on from where he's at and spread Jesus' message to brand new geographic locations. This man is minutes away from death. He has zero to offer Jesus. And so how does Jesus respond to this man who for all intents and purposes had been his enemy and has nothing to offer? Or how does Jesus respond to us? Because we need to see ourselves in this criminal. He is us, we are him. Romans 5 verses 8 through 10, they talk about how, how we, because of our nature and our actions, are enemies of God because of our sin. Isaiah 64, 6 says that even our good actions, our good works are like dirty rags in God's sight apart from him. And so just like this criminal, 
We are enemies of God and we have zero to offer. God isn't impressed by how much money you make. God isn't impressed by the business deal you made last week. All of us, apart from Jesus, are enemies of God and have zero to offer. So how does Jesus respond to this criminal? How does Jesus respond to you? He shows grace. The repentant criminal makes this humble request, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answers him, truly I tell you. That's a Greek statement of emphasis. This is locked in. This is assured. Truly I tell you, Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Or I love what Paul says in Romans 8.1, echoing this same theme. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, zero, none, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now back to Jesus' promise in Luke 23. Today you'll be in paradise. It's, it's easy to focus on the paradise part of that promise. And for sure, that is amazing. I mean, people who place their faith in Jesus, who follow him as their Savior and Lord, their identities are transformed. A few weeks back, I was, I was in the hospital with a friend who was days away from dying. And everybody knew it. He was on hospice. He, he, he lost his battle with cancer. And, and, and he was talking about his funeral, which he knew was coming very shortly. So it was an honor to be there with him, to pray with him, with his family and to talk about what he would be experiencing soon, what he is experiencing now. You see, his soul wouldn't sleep for hundreds of years until someday far away in the future. He wouldn't have to go through any sort of transition phase, burning off impurities until he was right enough to get into heaven. We we talked about how he would close his eyes on earth and open them in the presence of Jesus in paradise. This passage that we read here, it reinforces that truth. Today, you'll be in paradise. That is the immediate experience of every believer who dies. But look closely at that verse with me. You see, Jesus doesn't just say, today you'll be in paradise. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. As I was studying for this week, here's a quote I ran across in one of the commentaries I was spending some time in. The quote says that that amazing promise of paradise isn't the best part of this verse. We tend to emphasize the words in paradise. But really we should emphasize with me. The thief would get to be with Jesus forever. And being with Jesus, that's the definition of paradise. Jesus is the hope of heaven. He's the promise. He's the reward. Isn't that the difference between these two thieves? The first wants Jesus for what he can do for him. He's willing to have Jesus as his Messiah. If Jesus meets his demands, Jesus, get me off this cross. The second man just wants Jesus. I tell you the truth, Jesus tells to this this hardened criminal until just minutes earlier, Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' response is grace. And that brings us right up against our third takeaway, where we we come face to face with the beauty of grace. Despite this criminal's past, despite the fact that he had zero to offer, Jesus shows him grace. His heart is transformed and his eternity is changed. And it had nothing to do with what he did. It is all because of Jesus, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Some of you are listening to me right now and you are haunted by your past. I mean, you know what you've done. I mean, maybe you've been convicted by the authorities. You're sitting in one of the mods and you're awaiting sentencing. Maybe for you it's being, being shunned by family and friends and feeling like an outcast and isolated because of very real things that you have indeed done. Maybe for you it's an unethical business deal that that has left this wake of damage behind it. 
Maybe it's broken relationships. Maybe it's an addiction that owns you. Maybe it's words you've said to a child or a parent that you know you can never get back. But, but you know what it is to have deep regrets, to look back on whatever that thing is and like to have this, this visceral gut level reaction of like, how could I have done that? You know what it is to feel self-condemned. Maybe you were asking yourself the question we started today with, am I beyond the hope of change? The great news of this passage is the beauty of the gospel, that you are never beyond the hope of change, that Jesus always, till the 11th hour, 59th minute, whatever you've done, however late in the game it is, Jesus offers forgiveness. What Paul says in Romans 8, it can be true of you when you follow Jesus, that there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We just need to follow the lead of this repentant criminal where we look to Jesus as our Savior and King, where we humbly admit the reality and the depth of our sin, where we deserve hell apart from Jesus because, because sin is cosmic treason. It is that big of a deal. And then we look to Jesus and we embrace the reality of his grace because it's the reality of that grace that energizes and ignites all of this. John Newton was a man who lived in the 18th century and, and he was as steeped in sin as someone can get. He was a slave trader, so many horrendous things going on through that. And then he was a sailor for much of his life. Sailors aren't often known for high moral standards. But then, but then John Newton met Jesus and he became a Christian. And so, so Newton had life experience with the bottom of the barrel. He, he did things that he could close his eyes and have that gut level, visceral reaction about. And John Newton knew God's grace. He, he's the man who actually wrote that song that we've probably all heard, Amazing Grace. That was penned by John Newton. And listen to what John Newton said shortly before he died at the age of 82. Newton said, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. That I am a great sinner. And that Christ is a great savior. Everyone who, here who follows Jesus has been saved by that same life-changing, transforming, powerful grace. We are all of us in desperate need. We are hopeless because of our sin. And it is only because of God's grace that we can stand confident in personal relationship with him. And that offer, that grace, God extends to everyone who would turn to him the same way this criminal does in Luke 23. Aware of who Jesus is, aware of our need and depending on him. Our stories are different, but God's grace is central to every one of them. So are people ever beyond the hope of change? Hopefully by now the answer to that is like resounding in your ears. Tim, we get it, but don't miss this. No way is the answer. Well, we are never beyond the hope of change, however dark your past, however little you have to offer, however late in the game it is, that there is hope today, there is hope right now for you. And it's because of Jesus, because of his grace. We've seen this posture of change that centers around Jesus. It includes a humble awareness of our sin and a humble trust in Jesus. And grace is central in all of this. So now let me ask you a few questions that, that, that I would love it if you would just talk about over lunch today, over, over dinner this evening, later on this week with friends and family. Three questions for us. First question, have you, have you received God's grace? You see, this isn't something anyone else can do for you. You aren't born into God's grace. 
Your parents can't do this for you. This isn't true of you just because you show up for church or because you try really hard to be a good person. No, instead, this is a, this is a personal and conscious decision every one of us need to make. Am I going to let Jesus in? Am I going to trust him? Am I aware of my need, both because of my sin and my need for a Savior and Lord, who is Jesus Christ? Have you received God's grace? Second question, is God's grace still amazing to you? God's grace isn't something we receive and then move on from. I mean, to use some theology language, we are justified by grace through faith. Our works have nothing to do with that. And then we are sanctified, we're made godly, we're, we're, we're transformed into increasing Christ-likeness by that same grace. It's not like we're saved by grace and then kept by our effort. That's not what the Bible teaches. We are saved by grace and we are kept by grace. That is great, good news. Earlier this month, Carrie and I celebrated 22 years of marriage, which is crazy to think we've been married that long. She still loves me, what can I say? Um, but, but the thing I've thought about probably more the last year or so than I ever have the prior years is how much I feel like I'm still getting to know Carrie, how much I'm still discovering new things about her. I never stop pursuing her. I'll never be done knowing Carrie. And that is the same posture we should take towards God's grace. We don't check off the box, say, yep, we get it. If grace ever becomes familiar to us in a way that we're bored with it, that we shrug our shoulders towards it, we've missed it. The, the longer we're a Christian, the more amazed by God's grace we should be. Are you still amazed by God's grace? And then last question, are you extending God's grace? Are you gracious to others? This isn't a question for the person sitting next to you. This isn't a question for the person you hope really hears this message later on this week. This is a question for the person you look at in the mirror. This is a question for you. Would others describe you as gracious? Are you extending grace to others? God's grace to us is so amazing. We should be so willing to extend that same grace to others, to celebrate God's activity in their, in their lives and in their hearts, to hold out in persistent hope for God's ability to work and to change. So have you received grace? Are you still amazed by it? And are you extending grace to others? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, we, we pause now to very intentionally, each of us in our hearts, to say, Jesus, thank you for your grace. We are the criminal in Luke 23. And so Jesus, would you work in our hearts in such a way that you touch everyone gathered at Miller to Elkhorn, those watching online, the mods at the Correction Center, Jesus, through your Holy Spirit working in our hearts, help us to see in fresh ways, or maybe for the very first time, the amazing nature of your grace. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, now let's hear from Andy. Uh, Jesus is still changing lives. And Andy's story is a powerful, powerful testimony to how this is still happening in our midst today. My name is Andy. In 2018, I went to jail. I, uh, the cops uh, raided my house. I, had seven, I ended up with 17 felonies that day. After I, after I had got out and uh, um, got, I, got, I got in trouble again, I got 11 more felonies and a misdemeanor. So now I'm looking at 28 felonies. I got a five to life on me, um, several um, I don't know what it was. It ended up like 300 some years or whatever. I don't. I don't remember. To describe being a, t a condemned criminal, I would say you're living on borrowed time. Um, 
you know, whether you're you're waiting to get, you know, sentenced, I mean, it's still not free. You're still not free. You're, you're, you know that your time's coming. Um, to, to know um, that I can take God on his word and, and freedom is, is one of them that I stand on, you know. Yeah, it's freedom from our sinful nature, but it's freedom from the law too, you know, and, and I forget the second part sometimes because you want to uh, live for the Lord and, and try to, kind of like Galatians, it's like we want to earn his favor and, and Paul's like, what are you guys doing? You know, after, after uh, you know, get, getting saved by, by faith, now you're trying to earn things. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus and, and um, what he's done for us. And I just got to remember to get the word and, and get reminded of that. Oh God, if you're doing this right now, what are you going to do a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now? You know, so I just see um, this thing unfolding. You know, we serve a big God, so it's going to be huge. So it's, it's uh, exciting to be a part of that, to come here and just watch this thing unfold.